We're finally here, election week in Michigan, for the presidential primary and a whole host of local issues, including a millage for the Detroit Institute of Arts. Ten days ago, we thought it would be between Bernie Sanders and Michael Bloomberg in Michigan. But in politics, you just never know. And today we find ourselves in a battle for the Great Lakes state between former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Bernie Sanders. Joining us now in studio is Oakland University Professor David Dulio. Well, Michigan must be important because these two gentlemen have been all over the state. They have. Um, what are they attempting to do? Who's looking for whom to get to the polls? Well, I think they're both looking for the same thing, which is a large number of delegates to the Democratic National Convention over the summer that are available here in Michigan. We've got 125 up for grabs uh, based on the results tomorrow. They're both looking for as many as they can get Biden to increase his delegate lead over Senator Sanders and Sanders to try to eat into that lead a little bit. They're gonna target different groups and you've seen this play out on the airwaves. Uh, there's been pretty heavy spending here uh, over the last week or so. Uh, Biden with African Americans and Sanders with younger voters. So in 2016, uh, Sanders won Michigan. Yep. It surprised some people. Mm -hmm. uh, he did really well, and he his people kind of stuck around in Michigan. But suddenly, it looks like Biden has a a huge advantage, 24 points, I think, in the most recent poll. That's a pretty that's a pretty shocking number. I'd be surprised if it got that high uh, in terms of margin tomorrow. Sanders, as you say, still does have a base of support here. His voters are going to turn out. They've been, uh, frankly, not unlike President Trump's supporters. Right? They're loyal, so they're gonna they're gonna stick around and show up for Bernie. Whether or not it's enough is a whole other question. And, and I would. At this point, I don't think it will be. As we've seen in the last uh, several primaries, the turnout that he has needed from younger voters on college campuses has not been there, at least to the extent that he needs it to overcome Biden's advantages in other areas. Well, we saw Sanders at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. and people were there. They were fired up. They, they, they were there for the rally. Right. How do you get them from the rally to the polls? Well, and... <laughs> Most of those folks will vote, right? But that was maybe estimated at about 10,000 mm -hmm. people. Uh, several hundred thousand are going to be cast, right? So it's really a drop in the bucket when it comes to a, one particular rally. He needs to see that kind of turnout uh, across the state. Whether he gets it is, is an open question. So how big do you think the turnout will be? Because we've talked to some election officials who said expect the results to come in slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that's because of the absentee ballots, but, but, but also because they expect a, a large turnout. When they say a large turnout, how big of a turnout do they mean? I, I think it depends. Uh, and it, it's a little bit hard to, to gauge because we've seen predictions of large turnouts in previous primaries, and it hasn't materialized. Turnout in primaries tends to be up and down. The high watermark seems to be 2008 when Barack Obama ran for the first time. And we've seen in the last several across a bunch of states, turnout hit 2012, 2016 levels, but not 2008. So it's a, it's a matter of um, identifying supporters and making sure they get to the polls for both campaigns. And uh, so uh, when you look at uh, Biden versus Sanders, is, is this Biden momentum, is that really what it is? Just uh, he, all of a sudden he's the, the guy and everybody wants to talk about him, right. they're all fired up about him? Or is it endorsements from so many of these other candidates and their people are like, well, my, my person's out, I need someone to go for. Mm -hmm. they're, they're saying Biden, so I guess I'm going to go Biden. It's a combination of factors, right? There's not one thing that would point you to it. I think there's, you cannot question the momentum that Biden has gotten out of South Carolina and then Super Tuesday. It has been uh, all over the country that he seems to have, he seems to be rising in the polls and not even rising, rising rapidly. You've seen him even on the air here in Michigan try to take advantage of that. It, whether it's, a, it's Biden's campaign or a super PAC that supports him, there are uh, screenshots of Super Tuesday. Biden, winner, Biden, winner. And it's, a, it's an attempt to get people to say, I want to be behind this, this person that looks like they're going to win. So I, but I think endorsements matter. Um, Biden has gotten several here in Michigan that are important, whether it's Alyssa Slotkin, Haley Stevens, who had endorsed Bloomberg and then comes on board, Governor Whitmer. Uh, Bernie Sanders gets um, Jesse Jackson the other day. How, how big of a role is that? Probably less so than people's home state 
elected officials. I saw an interesting article. Uh, it was about Detroit pastors saying, uh, don't make the mistake Hillary Clinton made, mm -hmm. which was to count on the pastors to tell the people who come to their services uh, who to vote for, that the candidate has to go talk to the people directly. Right. And they were warning Biden not to make that same mistake, suggesting that maybe he was counting too much on the pastors to get the vote out when he needs to go talk to the people directly and encourage them to vote. A, a candidate's best weapon for getting somebody to vote for them is their own words, right? It, a face-to-face, person-to-person uh, appeal is still the best way to get somebody to vote for you. And I think that those folks are right that said, look, Hillary Clinton took, took Michigan, took Detroit, took African-American voters for granted. So which of these candidates on the Democratic side would help Michigan the most? Michigan has its own unique issues. It does. Uh, and I think that it's, it probably is varied. I also am not sure we can really tell uh, because, A, we don't know what the Congress is going to look like uh, in 2021 with the start of the 117th Congress, what that relationship is going to be like. I also think that it's it's fair to look at some of the things that these candidates are promising and ask them how they're going to do it. Because many of them, we're going to get this done, we're going to get that done. They can't do it by themselves, right? They need the other parts of the government to fall in line. And I'm not so sure that that's going to happen with, with much of this stuff. And in the polls I've been seeing, both Sanders and Biden beat Trump and Michigan head to head. Do you think that changes after uh, you truly get a head to head? I, I do. I think that, that once uh, the Trump campaign and its allies can focus on one candidate, they will start uh, they'll start their attacks. They'll start to make the contrast, uh, frankly, that Democrats have been making with, with Trump for months. And I think that once we get down to uh, a one-on-one, -on -one, we, we know who it's going to be, we know what the contrasts are going to look like, you'll start to see uh, polling shift a little bit. And I imagine the independents will come and want to look at the, at the next debate between Trump and whoever the candidate is and then make their decision. I, I think that that comes at the end of September. I think a lot of opinions are going to be formed even before that happens. Okay. Thanks for joining us sure today. Sure thing. More news now after this. Stay with us. The polls open in the morning and voters will have their opportunity to decide who will run against Donald Trump in November for President of the United States. Joining us now is the State Representative of Michigan's 1st District, Stephanie Chang. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It is nice to meet you. I've not met you before. Nice so you. tell us about the area you represent. It's a pretty yeah. diverse area. Oh, I love it. So the 1st District is uh, a lot of Detroit and a lot of Down River. Um, so a huge chunk of the east side, um, a lot of southwest Detroit, all of downtown, and then River Rouge, Ecorse, Wyandotte, Riverview, Trenton, Woodhaven, Gibraltar, Grosse Seal, and part of Brownstown. So it's a really diverse district, um, lots of different neighborhoods, uh, lots of different people, diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, but also class and everything else. So we got a we got our hands full with a with a lot a wide range of issues. I love it. Do you find it difficult to kind of come up with one voice of the first district with so many different yeah, people? Yeah, well. Um, sometimes, um, but I love the challenge. I, I love taking on a tough challenge. And I also think that, um, you know, across the board, there are certain things that everyone cares about, you know, good schools, clean water, fixing our roads. There are some basic things. Solving then, the opioid problem. All of, the, all of these things. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously there are some, some areas of my district that have uh, more acute needs than others and it sort of depends on what's going on but um, I love a, I love a challenge and I also you know given my organizing and um, organizing career as my background I do try to really focus in also on issues affecting people who are most vulnerable um, whenever I can um, but as much as I can I also try to re represent the entire balance of the district the best that I can and so far I people seem to think I'm doing okay so Enough about you for now. Let's talk Sounds about this good. election. Yes. No, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, if I got it right, Michigan needs a social justice warrior, someone who digs deep on every issue from an equity and justice lens. You said that? I did. And you were talking about Elizabeth Warren. I was. And that was your candidate. That was my candidate. And she dropped out on you. 
She did, and I'll be honest, um, I, and I know that I'm not the only one, there's a number of us who really were heartbroken when she left the race. Um, for me and a number of others, you know, there's a lot of reasons why, uh, but for me especially, um, knowing that she was exceptionally qualified, had some of the most comprehensive plans, and for me she was um, really the only presidential candidate in a long time that was talking about issues from a race justice you know, equity lens, uh, whether it was her maternal health plan or her housing plan. And now I feel like I'm doing her stump speech, but, no, but you know, but I, 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 there was, was so really much strong. that resonated I, I, with yeah, me. We yeah. watched her in the debates and she did really well. And it yeah. kept surprising me that more people didn't turn towards her. Uh, and then I guess when uh, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar dropped out and threw their support to Biden, yeah. it was a, a game changer, I guess, for her. I think so. I think it was a game changer for this entire election. Um, and I, you know. Did, did you get your memo that you have to support Biden or does, <laughs> is that not how did it Did not works? get any memo. <laughs> uh, did not get any memo, although, of course, there's folks, you know, so I'll, it's an interesting dynamic in my household. My husband is, is a moderate. I am a self-identified progressive. And um, and then I represent a district that again has a wide range of viewpoints. Um, I, I ideology ideologically I probably align more with Bernie. Um, yet I represent a district where I think on the whole a lot of folks are going to be supporting Biden um, just from hearing from people in my community. Um, and so it's a, it's a weird time. I'm kind of ready for the primary to be over um, and obviously we'll be supporting whoever the nominee is in November and working hard to defeat Donald Trump knocking on doors and making phone calls. So people are, gonna, people are going to be watching tonight and uh, then they're going to go and vote tomorrow. Who do you want people to go vote for, or are you going to just sit on the sidelines and say, we just want you to go vote? Yeah, we want people to go vote. I mean, one of the things that's really exciting is that um, we've seen huge surges. Obviously, we've got Proposal 3 in effect now, so people can vote absentee with no reason. Um, and we've, we're seeing huge surges in people voting absentee, which is really exciting um, for those who are still kind of making up their minds. And I know that there are some who are still undecided before sure. tomorrow. Um, I, you know, I, the most important thing is just to go vote. I am not publicly endorsing anyone at this point. Um, I, I think that um, people need to vote um, one of the things that has been frustrating about this primary, though, is that I, I am one person who really um, was in it to vote with my heart, um, and my heart was with, Liz was with Elizabeth Warren. I think a lot of people are voting out of fear, um, and I totally understand it. And I and I and I think that you know, as Democrats, we need to be united around defeating Donald Trump. However, um, it is sort of it's been a weird primary season in thinking about electability and voter psychology when voters are trying to predict what other voters are gonna do in order to make their own decision rather than just going with what they think is the best. Yeah, so it's, 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 odd. It's, it's kind of odd, this whole uh, you know Biden bandwagon kind of thing. It's like, wait, I wanna be with the winner, so everybody told me he's gonna win, so I better get over here, when really nobody's decided anything. I mean, people can go out and decide for themselves who's gonna win. Right, absolutely. I think people need to look at people's, in any election, whether it's for president or a county commission race or a state senate race or whatever else, is to really look at what does the person stand for? What are your values and how do they match up? What are their plans? And that's why I loved Elizabeth Warren because she had really comprehensive plans. Um, and you know, I, I, I hope that we can get to a point again in our country where people are, are voting out of hope and courage and, and out of their heart. We saw uh, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and many more go over to Biden now. Does that make it hard, do you think, for some people who might want to support Bernie Sanders to come out and say, no, I want Bernie Sanders? Um, you know, I don't think so, because I think that the folks who are publicly supporting Bernie were probably going to anyway, and especially with Warren being out, there are folks who maybe were like going between the two that now they can be open to publicly endorsing Bernie. Um, I obviously would, I'm not in that category, but I, um, I think that um, you know people just need to do what they need to do. I, I hope again that after this primary season is over, and I'm really <laughs> looking forward to being over, that we can just all come together. Um, it's been really um, frustrating, honestly, to watch some of the back and forth on social media um, between um, folks from different camps. And um, there's been, 
I think social media brings a heightened level of just meanness sometimes sure. and uh, it's frustrating to watch when at the when I know that we all share the same values um, but we need to do a better job of understanding that people have different life experiences that lead them to making the choices that they make I would never want to discount where someone is coming from and why they're supporting someone right and so uh, I'm, I'm just ready for the primary to be over. <laughs> Looking forward to the end of tomorrow night. All right, let's get back into some more of your issues after the break. We'll be back with more news now after this. We continue our conversation with State Representative Stephanie Chang. So uh, one of the things that's going to be really interesting tomorrow is who gets their people out. It's, I guess yeah. that's always interesting. But it looks like uh, Biden is working hard in the African-American community and uh, Bernie Sanders is working hard in the Muslim community. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Are, is, is everybody going to come vote because they're very uh, excited about the opportunity to go after Donald Trump in November? Or do you think some people will stay home? I think that we're going to see increased turnout. I mean, we know that from the absentees in terms of uh, people going to vote in person. I'm not sure if the people who have voted absentee, if they would normally have voted in person or if we're seeing like an uptick in numbers overall. But I would imagine that it's um, an increase overall, uh, which I think is a good thing. You know, I think it's a good thing for our democracy. It's always good when more people are making their voices heard. Um, you know, remains to be seen. I'll be really interested in seeing um, the breakdown by county, by city, even by precinct to kind of see, you know, who really turned out for who. Um, and then, of course, also who voted early for who compared to who voted in person. Um, so it'll be interesting. Before this weekend watching, uh, really the only people I saw in Michigan were Bloomberg and Trump. Uh, <laughs> and now, of course, today, for sure, uh, Sanders yeah. and Biden are everywhere. Yeah. Um, but do you think um, they did enough to get people to, to, to get out and go vote? Because I say that in part because some pastors were saying, don't count on us to tell people to go vote for sure. you. You come and talk to them yeah. and tell them to go vote. Yeah, and I, I would agree with those pastors. You know, I think it's really important for any level of candidate to really be out talking to people directly. Um, and, you know, I love the rallies, love all of that, but also just going out and talking to people who may not show up at a rally. Um, so I know that folks have been going to different churches and mosques, and I, and I think that outreach is all really, really important. And then also for the surrogates who have been coming in, um, and also the local surrogates, which again, I think is also really important that there are folks locally, um, because you know who better to hear from than someone who you may have already voted for to tell you what they think about someone, or how they're, and also to really look at how is this person gonna address issues specific to Detroit and Downriver in Michigan, um, because I think a lot of the national talking points, of course, do um, affect Michigan, but also we've got major infrastructure issues, which I feel like haven't really gotten highlighted as much in the national debates. And of course, looking at clean drinking water is a huge Michigan issue and has gotten talked about a little bit, but would love to hear more from some of the candidates. So uh, I think you're hearing more of that over this past weekend and hopefully today um, with both candidates going to Flint and in Detroit. So, um, you know, we will see. They, both candidates have to be aware of the issues that Michigan yeah. has, whether or not they're going to make it a, a big important part of their, their plan once they leave Michigan is, is important for us to keep an eye on because these issues are so crucial to us. So crucial. Mm -hmm. And we're a Great Lakes state. Um, and I think a lot of the issues that face us as a Midwest um, Great Lakes state also affect a lot of other states in the Midwest. And I think that a lot of the issues that are on Michigan minds are probably on the minds of other folks across the country as well. So in your effort to get things done, uh, you've been uh, sort of teaming up on some issues with Rashida Tlaib. Um, what brought that uh, union together and, uh, and, and how's that going so far? She gets a lot of attention. Yeah, yes she does. <laughs> um, so uh, Rashida and I are actually, we go back to I think 2006, we've known each other for a long time, both before we were elected. And um, you know, she and I are both very passionate. It comes out in different ways, but we're, we're both very <laughs> passionate and uh, we're good friends and we uh, love serving the community and a lot of, she is a mentor of mine she's someone who I really look up to in terms of her 
uh, she is so courageous. Um, and so we've worked together, especially a lot on environmental justice issues. You know, we both represent areas where um, clean air is a huge problem and industrial pollution is a huge problem. We both are very passionate about water issues. We're both passionate about housing justice. So there's a lot of alignment there. Um, so we've actually done a few things together, both um, on issues and then also starting to do some events together, both me and Rashida and then also Councilwoman Raquel Castaneda Lopez yeah. in Southwest Detroit. Um, and I was going to mention her, but yeah. I didn't think I, I thought I'd butcher your name. So I thought oh, I'd okay, let you there we go. It. So I got it. I got it. I got you covered. Um, and the three of us, um, in addition to being friends and sharing our values, we both also come from a place of, uh, you know, we're all daughters of immigrants. We both um, sort of have a value set that aligns really well. And so, you know, why not find ways to support each other, lift each other up and uh, work on issues together. We don't always agree on everything, but on probably 99% of things we do. Um, and so it's great to be able to collaborate. So tell me about the challenges of, of representing the voices that have a hard time getting heard. Oh man, well, that, yeah, you know, I think that it, so many of the issues that I work on um, that are directly affecting vulnerable communities are uphill battles. You know, they're not the types of issues where there's a lobbyist in Lansing working on that issue, or it's something where there's like a ready-made bill that someone made, right, for me to introduce, right? These are things where sometimes it's an issue where no one else is talking about it, yet I gotta figure out a way. So one example um, is, you know, with the, we've got a lot of conversation right now about housing in Detroit and specifically around tax foreclosure. Well, one of those problems is around this poverty exemption that people can apply for. Well, we've talked about that, but no one's really talking yet about, well, how do we, if someone is poor and they've already filled out the application and they're on a fixed income, why are we making them fill it out every single year and going through hoops to get this paperwork done when we already know? So um, right now I'm working with some housing justice advocates, Michelle Oberholter at the United Community Housing Coalition, which is an amazing organization, uh, to look at legislation that would make it stick, basically. We know that you're facing poverty. Let's find a way to, to make sure that you don't have to pay for the property taxes that you can't afford. Um, and so, I love working on issues where we actually work hand in hand with folks in the community to come up with solutions together and then introduce a bill together. Um, because I think that's what a representative democracy really should look like, is people listening directly to their constituents, especially the folks who normally don't have a voice in Lansing, and lifting up those issues and finding uh, ways to introduce policy together. I have a ton of other things I want to talk to you about that you've done, but we're out of time. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> you got to promise to come back. I will come back. And I'll be nice to you. Sounds you come good. Back <laughs> and I'll let you know that we're on TV and, and right. everything's going to be okay. <laughs> but really, I appreciate it. You have so many things that you're involved in, and I really do hope you'll come back when we have more I time will. to get into it. All right, thanks. And remember to vote. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. For everyone here at News Now, I'm Kevin Dietz. Good night.